Hello, hello. Happy Tuesday, everybody. This is uh, Cheryl Mack from the Bridge Art Gallery. And we're excited to start our Artist Talk series again. Uh, this week, we are featuring Heather Williams, who currently has an art exhibition at the Bridge Art Gallery called Protective Spirits. And so we're sending out um, all of our ancestors to communicate to everyone virtually to join this Facebook Live and YouTube Live Artist Talk. I am Cheryl Mack, and along with my husband, Christopher Mack, we are the co-owners of the Bridge Art Gallery, which is located at 199 Broadway in Bayonne, New Jersey. Uh, we feature art exhibitions at our gallery space, and we are so excited to add Heather Williams to the roster of artists that we've showcased at the gallery. And we're going to bring Heather in to talk about protective spirits. Hi. Welcome, welcome, Heather. Welcome, and thank you so much. Thank you for this opportunity, Cheryl. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So, Heather, tell us a little bit about yourself and your journey as an artist. About myself and my journey as an artist. Okay. Um, where should I start? Well, I'll start with being um, that I was born in uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands of St. Croix and um, was raised in Brooklyn for most of my life. And I always knew that I wanted to be an artist. Um, I was encouraged to find a proper job. <laughs> and so, um, so that's what I, you know, that's what I did. I took, you know, um, other avenues before I um, reached where I am right now. Those avenues included everything from, you know, doing finance to uh, a major shift into the field of art therapy where I worked with the domestic violence population for um, over 10 years. And then uh, once I started having a family, I was thinking about their education. So I um, I started teaching in the uh, Montessori um, arena. So I became a um, certified Montessori primary teacher and um, I, I still work in that environment as an art teacher. And that, it's been like over 12 years. So I really feel though that that my work as an art therapist, my work as a teacher, all of those things inform the way that I work today. So um, anyway, there was a very long period of time that I was doing any, any art at all, uh, not through junior high school, not through high school, was um, back in, in uh, undergrad back in 1991, where you know I just needed some full-time credits. I decided to take an art class and it just reawakened my desire to create art and to continue um, doing art since, since that time. So that was the, uh, the catalyst for pushing you onto the trajectory that you, you're currently on now. Yeah, I um, there were a lot of starts and and stops. I was doing mostly figurative work at at that time, and then um, I would say when I went back to grad school in 2018, um, I just decided. In fact, this was while I was teaching. I I decided that I didn't want to have any regrets in life that I never went to pursue my first love, which is to um, be an artist and to, to share the work that I do as an artist. Um, so I went back to grad school. And since then I graduated in 2020 from the School of Visual Arts. And since then I've been really putting a lot more work and focus and in intention to my practice as an artist. Okay, yeah. so tell us a little bit about the current art exhibition, uh, Protective Spirits. What was the uh, the inspiration behind creating uh, this art exhibition? So um, 
This particular in exhibition, I feel, is a continuation of the work that I was creating during the height of the pandemic. I was thinking a lot about the social uprisings. Um, I was thinking about the safety of Black bodies. Um, and and the, the idea of safety is multi-layered, especially during that time being under quarantine. So um, you have the what happened with Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd. We, you know, so many, so many people. And then add on the situation of being under quarantine and having a, you know, a, a pandemic. So now we're, we're thinking, um, you know, now I'm talking about safety of, of the body, you mm -hmm. know, health wise. Um, not to mention climate change, like all of these things were going on in, in running through my mind while I was um, doing this particular work. And um, I didn't initially just come to the, the, the name Protective Spirits, but I definitely was thinking about, um, you'll see the, the witnesses that I create those sculptures and um, how they are witnesses to the past, present and, and future for everything that's been going on. And um, almost lost my train of thought there. <laughs> so so what, but, what are the, when you were creating this art exhibition, who do you see as the protective spirits? Wow, I definitely see um, our ancestors. Okay. And when I say our ancestors, I'm thinking, you know, African ancestors the people who um, tr across the transatlantic, you know, um, slave the, into the diaspora, the diaspora. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Those are the people who are, um, I'm thinking about, we are, you know, survivors. And, but not just that period of the time, the period of time before colonialism and, you know, all of that lost history is what I'm thinking about. Um, and when I think about protective spirits, I, I also think about um, my, my Caribbean ancestry. So, mm -hmm. you know, when we start looking at some of the, the paintings, I um, incorporated this idea of the Moko Jumbi because I remember as a, a young child going to um, the Carib West Indian Day Parade on Eastern Parkway and, you know, hiding behind my, my parents because I was afraid of those blue devils running in the streets and, you know, um, just in awe of the, the people on, on stilts. And um, for those of you who don't know, those people walking on stilts are called Moko Jumbies and that they represent protective spirits in Trinidadian culture. So um, this body of work, I feel like is incorporating so many things from my culture, um, mm -hmm. my, you know, our ancestry. It's um, reclaiming things that, that have been lost. Okay, so, you know, that's a good segue into um, representation of, you know, what are some of the protective spirits? So we'll we'll start with the uh, the witness wall. So uh, tell us a little bit about you know some of the the sculpture pieces, how they were created, who they represent, and um, what they mean as a as a total collective. So I work um, very organically. Um, the sculptures that I create are not coming from any particular face. I um, I just keep you know working on them until they reach a point where I can feel that they have a presence. And usually, what that means is there's a look in the eyes that lets me know that okay, it's time to stop with this particular piece. Um, many of them also, I like to add a lot of texture to the hair because I know that 
Um, you know, texture is part of um, hair is a very strong part of our identity. So that's in there as, as well. Um, and what medium are you using? I'm using um, clay and they are all, uh, they're all made of fired clay. Okay. Yeah. So you, um, the faces, as you're working with the clay, they kind of form themselves and you let the, the ancestors kind of speak to you as you're, as you're creating them? Yeah, they, they definitely, you know, speak to me because, and, and as I said, I work organically. Um, so what that means is that I'm, I'm really, you know, I'm guiding the material, but at the same time, I'm looking to see what is, you know, what is being formed before me. And so, you know, there's a lot of freedom in working that way because then, you know, I'm not forcing it to be anything or any one specific. I'm not even forcing them to look perfect in any way or, you know, to have perfect asymmetrical features. It's really not about that. It's, it's more about, um, again, also, I think, I think that as an art therapist, having that kind of background, a lot of work is process oriented. And what that means is that the process of creating the work is just as important as the, um, the final image. So it doesn't have to be, you know, that I'm about making a thing of beauty or whatever we might think beauty is, because we could have a whole other conversation about um, beauty and what is beautiful and what that means. Um, but again, it's really just about, is this face, you know, at a point where it has a certain presence? So you mentioned- like. Go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned the process. Do you, uh, is it therapeutic for you as you're creating these? I think all of the artwork that, um, I, well, I think creating artwork is therapeutic in general. Okay. Right? Even though there's always very often a point of frustration that, oh, this is not coming out right, or this is, I don't know what's happening here. It's not pleasing to me. Those things happen whether I'm painting or sculpting or you know creating a video. That's just that's part of the process. And the thing about it is being able to persevere to keep going to get to that point where it's like, okay, I'm I'm at a good place right now. Okay. Yeah. You mentioned um, what I find striking about the uh, the witness wall um, and the sculptures. You mentioned that you know none of them are perfect, which is really um, you know very symbolic of us as individuals. None of us are are perfect, and there's beauty in our imperfections. And so what? What was the inspiration behind creating an entire wall of these sculptures and what do they they represent um, as a collective? I mean, I think in terms, like to me, um, the way I think is in terms of dualities and like multiple layers. So for me, there's no way that I could just make one face mm -hmm. to represent every single thing, you know what I mean? Um, one face could represent something I might've seen on the news just today, looking at you like, come on now, <laughs> you know? Or mm -hmm. another face might be, you know, maybe I was feeling sad one day or um, it, there's so, there's, it, it just, there's such a wide range. You know, and, and then when you think about, um, I think it's easy for people to want to put groups into a box mm -hmm. and, you know, 
when I'm thinking about Black people, we're not a monolith. Right. And so, you know, um, I could create these for endless days because, you know, and every every single one will represent more than one thing. And as a body, they all represent, have their own um, presence or energy. And so with this particular collection that's on display at the Bridge Art Gallery, um, what do you feel like it represents? I feel like um, for this particular, you know, body of work, it is, um, again, we're talking about protection. We're talking about um, being an observer. We're also thinking, talking about um, the power of silence, the, not necessarily science, silence, the power of, of quiet. That mm -hmm. um, that is part of who we are as well. I consider myself to be a quiet person, although um, some people in my family might not agree with that. But that's because they, you know, they they lived with me, so that's that's different. But but um, that's something that I think about also. You know, um, Rosa Parks was a quiet person. You know, there's 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 power there. And as a black woman, we're not always afforded the luxury of being seen as, you know, like that is part of who we are, that quiet, vulnerable, yet powerful side. And when I think about the um the witnesses, I see, I see them that way as well. So that um they are quiet, but if you spend time looking at um, them as a full body, every piece together as they are in the gallery right now, um, then then I believe there's still some some power within that that frame that they are saying something. You, if you go back to um, the Ife or Ifa sculptures of Benin, which is where I, I gained some of my inspiration from for these, these sculptures. Um, you can look at those sculptures and, and see like there, there's a story there. There's a story behind those amazing, amazing works. Um, and if, if you don't know about um, the Ife sculptures, I would encourage everyone to, to go back and do some research on, on that. Um, because again, they, you know, even without knowing the hands that created them, or for me, even not even seeing them in person, there's, there's something there. In fact, um, I was having an artist talk not too long ago and I was, um, encouraged by, uh, Ben Jones. Mm -hmm. to go to Nigeria because he said that, you know, you're calling the ancestors and the ancestors are calling you through this work. So, right. Yeah. I hope that. And uh, for those who don't know, Professor Ben Jones, he is a jewel, not only in the Jersey City art scene, but also the New Jersey art scene and the global art scene. So definitely um, look him up. Uh, if you have a chance to meet him in person, he is just such a, a dynamic, um, dynamic artist, educator, uh, human being, activist. Um, and, you know, it's definitely you know, one of those pillars where we need to give him the honor um, and his flowers while he's here. And he's just uh, such a jewel. And so I'm, I'm glad that he was able to pour that into you to um, suggest that you actually, you know, go to the continent, go to Nigeria um, in order to, you know, make that make those connections, um, you know, culturally, um, because, you know, there is 
you know, so much history just in our in our DNA. And I think what is, you know, just really incredible is how artists are able to um, connect with their culture through through art. And that's that's definitely what you've done you've done here. Um, so you know, you said that the the witnesses, um, you know, individually and and collectively are you know, telling our stories or, or bearing witness to, you know, our history, our past, our, even our present. And, and it, would you venture to say even to um, give us some foreshadowing of our future or warnings about our future? I would definitely say so. Um, you know, they say that if, if you know, if, if we don't understand our past, we are to repeat it and from yeah. what I can see there's just you know certain things that keep repeating themselves mm -hmm. um fortunately and some very unfortunate situations you can look in the news at any point in time and um see how certain things you know will continue to repeat themselves so it's like you know we're witnessing we witness an event, it could be a tragic event, but then what are what happens after that? Are we, um, what's the lesson learned? Because if there is no lesson learned and no action taken, then it's almost like foreshadowing. And so that's why I say they are observers of the past, the present and the future. If you could um, guide the experience of the gallery visitor who sees the witness wall, what are some of the key things that you hope that they walk away with? I would first, um, my, my hope would be that first they take the time to really take in, take in the entire body and then go in and look at each individual piece and see if something resonates with them or not. And you know, e either way, there's a message there, whether it resonates with you or not. And um, then let's have you know dialogue about it. You know, each person is going to see something different or see um, or have a different feeling from from any work. And I believe that that, you know, that's that's part of the purpose of sharing work to create these this dialogue. And the purpose mm -hmm. of, of sharing dialogue is, um, you know, we just came out of a situation where there was so much isolation and. Um, storytelling, sharing your dialogue, sharing artwork. I, I think it's all part of a um, very important healing process. You know, um, I just, I'm just recovering from COVID myself and I didn't have, you know, severe symptoms, um, but still, it's still just this feeling of, um, being restrained or, you know, isolated and um, not a good feeling. So, but to be, it, it's, it's a reminder of how important it is for um, us to be doing this work we're doing here right now, the work that Bridge Art Gallery has been doing, you know, in the community, um, I think it's really important for humanity. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, one thing that, you know, Christopher and I really take to heart is um, one, uh, we believe in the spirit of collaboration um, that, you know, we don't exist in, in silos. And so even during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, we were reaching out and including, you know, artists, but also reaching out to other other galleries, um, and trying to be, you know, supportive, you know, in any way, you know, possible. 
because again, we can't afford to exist in silos that, you know, we have to, you know, support each other, be encouragers, be therapists, um, you know, be a, a listening wall, but just, you know, be there for each other because we never know when, um, we, we never know how much just a kind word would mean to the next person or the check-in to say, you know, hey, how are you doing? Um, when they may not have heard, you know, from anyone or no one ever even thought to um, even check on them or they felt that that sense of isolation. Yes. Um, and the one thing that we're very fortunate about is the sense of community that we have, not only with the artists that we work with, but uh, other arts institutions that are showing, you know, showcasing artists, be it a gallery, um, you know, Nimbus Dance Theater, uh, what, uh, you know, Christine Goodman is doing you know, for artists in Jersey City, what's happening in Hoboken. But, you know, we're all in this together because it was really the arts that saved us all during the pandemic because, you know, the creatives never stopped creating. And um, whether you're painters, sculptors, uh, musicians, playwrights, everyone was still, you know, creating because that's the artist has the ability to really channel all their feelings and their emotions into what they do. And it's so pivotal and powerful and necessary for us mere humans who don't have that, you know, that gift. Uh, from God of you know, the ability to create. So um, not only to you, but all of the other artists that are that are watching, that you know the rest of humankind is you know eternally grateful for your ability to um, provide those rays of hope and and light by sharing your creativity online. So um, so. We're, we're going to move on from the, the witness wall because everyone who is watching is going to come into the Bridge Art Gallery to experience uh, the witness uh, wall as a collective because it really is a powerful experience when you see um, all of these faces, you know, together. Um, and everyone who's come into the gallery so far that has viewed the witness wall has definitely said, um, it, oh, this this one looks like someone that I know, or it reminds me of a, you know, you know, my aunt, my cousin, my neighbor, or my friend from childhood. But we always get the question, and even when you were at the gallery, we had the question of, were there models that you had in creating the faces, and um, and so you definitely shared with us today that you know it was a very organic process that. Um, you know, someone was whispering in your ear, like, do the hair like this, <laughs> or the ears like that, or the nose, you know, in another way. Um, so um, I, I do want to go through uh, a few, not only of the, uh, uh, the ones on the witness wall, but also um, highlight a, a few of your other um, sculptures. And if you can let us know how they differ from the witness wall. Those sculptures differ in the sense that, um, you know, just from a technical standpoint, they are made to to be placed on a stand. Um, I do it in such a way that I I I have them tilted a certain way so that they are looking upward um, mm -hmm. towards the viewer. I've started making um, like markings on the face recently. Again, that's due to some of my, my research on um, our ancestry and with, uh, with markings and so on. And so I've been experimenting with, with that. I also, um, you know, very similarly, the the hair is of very much importance, and uh, and the eye. So it's still a similar process, except that these don't um, hang on the wall. They 
stand on their own, mm -hmm. but very similarly, they still need to get to a point where they have their own presence as I'm creating them. Okay. Yeah. So let's transition, Heather, to your, your paintings, your protective spirit paintings. Now, um, this one is very interesting because it's, uh, I think, is a good segue between the witness wall and your paintings. Right. This one I um, created during my time at um, Man and Contemporary. I was at a residency where I created um, several paintings. Some of them you'll see here. And this piece, there were two of them actually. One of them was acquired by Eskef. And um, it is, it's like a combination of painting and sculpture that I was experimenting with. So she's still a witness. She has the texture and the hair and everything. If you get up close, you'll see that there, um, there are words in the papers in the, in the back, not necessarily um, like a specific story, but, but words to me represent storytelling. So mm -hmm. when you get a chance to um, visit the gallery, take a closer look and you'll see, you'll see um, that the words and, you know, people will have their different, their own word associations with, what they um with whatever resonates with them okay and so wh what came first the sculptures or the paintings or was it a process that was happening simultaneously happening simultaneously okay um, so i you know created the the sculpture itself in fact um I probably created the sculpture first, and then this was back, this was in uh, 2021. Created the sculpture first, went, got it fired. In the meantime, was painting on this wood um, that you see in the background. And so I wanted to see, you know, well, how would it be if I combine the two? Um, just to see, you know, how, how that would work. Cause I was playing around with the idea of combining my abstracts with my sculptures to see okay. what, what happens. So, you know, part of my practice is experimentation and with different materials and you know, um, seeing what happens. So that's a good segue into your um, abstracts. And uh, these are your protective spirit paintings. So tell us a little bit about um, the process of creating and also what it, it represents. This one is, I say this one is kind of crazy because it is a combination of, if you want to talk about experimentation, it there is acrylic paint and oil paint mixed in this one. What happened is, you know, as I was creating the piece, I saw um, I don't know if we could get a really good close up, but I saw some eyes forming that I did not go in there and say, I'm going to put two eyes there. But once I saw them forming, I said, okay, let me um, work around that and see how else I can, what else will come, come of this. So mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a piece that's best viewed um, in person because there's so many little intricacies and there's there in much of my abstract paintings, you will see faces emerge in different places, bodies emerge in different places. And um, again, those are things that happen um, intuitively. So I, it's a, it's a similar process. I think whether I'm doing regardless of what material I'm using, I want to have the freedom to allow certain things to emerge 
and then start making the choices of where to go from there. And so why do you, why did you title this um, collection uh, Protective Spirits? Because I was, um, as I was saying before, with the Moko Jumbi in mind, like for example, what I'm seeing is, you know, a, a body that has, um, that's looking kind of looking down. So how should I say it? So um, the position of the body is such that, you know, you'll see the form of a head and then the rest of the body um, spreads out in this kind of way to give the impression that it is like a tall image or body looking at us or looking at okay. the viewer or looking out or something like that or, or moving in space. And do you see that as um, ancestral protection of us as far as protective spirits or, or something else? I do. I, I think the, the entire theme when I think about protective spirits definitely is connected to um, ancestors. Mm -hmm. I was recently um, reading a book by, uh, and I hope I say his name correctly, Patrice Maladoma Somme. And he, he passed away, I believe in December or January. And um, he spoke a lot about um, the rites of passage that he went through. He was from Burkina Faso and he spoke about his experience and a lot about um, the ancestors and healing of the ancestors through our actions. And, you know, I can relate that even to, if you think about healing of the ancestors through our actions, how can we heal from past trauma or, you know, um, what actions can we take that are positive, that are healing to, um, I don't want to say rewrite the past, but to reclaim, reimagine, um, cope with, all of those things come out on the right. other side of those obstacles, being a stronger individual. Um, I hope that answers your question because I feel like I've gone off on a tangent a little. No, 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 it, it, it definitely <laughs> does. Um, because, you know, when you're, oftentimes when we have visitors that come to the gallery, they want to know what is the inspiration, not only from the entire exhibition, but also individual pieces. And so, you know, the witness wall itself is so powerful, you know, as a collective, and then you go through each individual phase. Um, and, but then, you know, there's always that, that question of why is it titled, you know, protective spirits? Um, you know, witness wall, I think is, you know, pretty self-explanatory, but mm -hmm. then when you get into abstracts, because, you know, the beauty of abstracts is that everybody sees something very different in it. Right. Um, and it's doing just that, which, you know, you talked about very early on in the, in this conversation about um, creating a dialogue and creating a conversation, because I may see something completely different than the next person mm -hmm. and, you know, the person after that. But, you know, it's great to have the artist's insight on what, you know, what was the artist's motivation, not only behind creating the work, but also naming it. And you have several um, abstracts in the gallery with the title Protective, you know, Protective Spirits 1, I think 1, 2, and 3, if I'm not right, mistaken. Right, right, right. Um, 
I, I want to add that in this particular piece, I see, I personally see a warrior. Okay. And, you know, I am very much aware that people will see all kinds of things. I've had people look at my work and say, oh, but I see this. And I look at it like, I don't see that. And it's just so amazing to me. You know, mm -hmm. but I, I think I think that's the beauty of it, actually. Um, here's another um, protective spirit where I was again experimenting with different materials, but the, these materials here I have um, ebony and burlap and acrylic paint and um, the ebony and the burlap in and of themselves. I feel are um, just representative of, of Black, of history, of, you know, um, they're, they're touching on different layers of our history, I would say. So Heather, what does this collection as in its totality um, mean to you personally? Um, wow. Okay. <laughs> personally, I would say that um, as a person of of African descent, I see I see strength. I mm -hmm. see um, I see power. I see quiet power that I spoke about. Mm -hmm. I see um, reclaiming of my past, of my history, things that have been lost, even including, you know, our true last names. Um, it's a, you know, a acknowledgement of it's an acknowledgement of, of our history and all that we have been through, the, uh, everything that we are still going through, but also um, thinking about, when I think about pr protection, as a mother raising two Black boys, um, protection is definitely something that I'm thinking about all the time. And you know, it's definitely just one of one of my desires, right? So, um, when so I think mentioned, about, go ahead. No, I was going to say that you, when you mentioned your role as a mother, I think that would be like a great time to bring in the um, the video that you actually created. Um, before I, you know, show a little clip from it, um, you want to give a little kind of setup on, um, this is just one of the, I think three videos that you have um, showing in the gallery as a part of a loop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yes, it's um, it's two videos. So mm -hmm. the video was created, the first video was created um, and that's the one that, that's showing at the gallery right now to give people a chance to see who haven't seen the first iteration of this short film called safe passage so um and it really is that safe passages is, is it takes you from viewing images from the past all the way up to the you know protective witnesses that are incorporated in the film and to a young man in this particular film who is, let's see, at that time he was, who is 11 years old in this film and asking that question, is there a safe passage for the black body? Mm -hmm. So you, before we show that, mm -hmm. um, I know you mentioned at the, the top of the discussion about, um, you know, during the pandemic, especially, you know, in 2020, um, as a, a protective mom of, you know, beautiful, very handsome 
you know, smart and insightful young men that you are guiding through, you know, through this world. Um, do you, and in essence, you're their protector. Um, you're their protective spirit. So as you're, as you were creating, you mentioned this being a whole organic process. Were as you were creating the work, were you also seeking guidance on how to, um, you know, protect your babies? <laughs> seeking guidance. I'm not even sure I'd have to really think about that question because I, you know, this was created, like I said, in, at the height of the pandemic. So I had my babies right there with me mm -hmm. <laughs> for better or for worse, because remember they, you know, they were home from school and that was a very tough transition. I have to say mm -hmm. it was a really, really tough transition for the first two weeks for all parties involved. So you have to remember there's that going on simultaneously. Um, I'm trying to get through grad school and we're witnessing people getting killed. Mm. And you know what that does as as a mother, you know, I feel emotional thinking about it um, because I still have to let my kids go out and, and live and see their friends and go to the park and stuff like that. But um, so I mentioned that, you know, um, that it's process oriented. And, and, you know, whenever I talk about this, I always say I, I had no desire to physically build this installation. I mm -hmm. wanted someone else to come put up the two by fours and build the whole thing and let me do the rest. And mm -hmm. that person didn't show up, but I had all the material. And so I, I built, I built this eight foot by this 16 feet and eight feet wide, eight feet tall, 16 feet in depth. And, um, I built the structure and then I, covered it with fabric and everything. And the, you know, the more I think about it, it just feels like trying to create this, this uh, really safe, like protective space. But I can't necessarily call it just a space because to me, then it sounds stagnant and they need something that's more of a passageway that's, that's moving from one point to, to another as they will in life. Um, right. But so, which is why, so I call it the safe passage. And um, I don't even remember the question now because <laughs> I just got, you know, into this thing of what it is to be a mom um, and see such tragedy over and over and over again. Well, I mean, it definitely wants us to, or spurs us to want to hold our, our children closer to us. Um, and I know as a mom that I, you know, I just want to protect my daughter from all hurt and harm, you know, be it, you know, mentally, spiritually, or, or physically. And, um, you know, during 2020, we had these things that we could not protect them from right. because there mm -hmm. was a pandemic rage raging in the world right. um, with, you know, at that time, no, no answers. It was just a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, and then we had, you know, civil unrest that, it, and I have to preface this, preface civil unrest in a very specific way, civil unrest to the point where the rest of the world saw it in rotation. But yeah. any person of color has always experienced a degree of civil unrest, um, you know, be it 
you know, trying to shop in a store or, you know, being a, a male or female of color, driving through the neighborhood you live in or a friend's neighborhood and, you know, getting pulled over, being, you know, suspicious. So I think in general, we've always experienced, you know, sometimes for some of us on a daily basis, civil unrest, but um, yeah. what we were witnessing with, you know, George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor is just um, the rotation of these videos um, of, you know, tragedy on the news cycle. Um, right. We've been seeing uh, these things for hundreds of years, right? right. Mm -hmm. So the thing is that when they do happen again, and it's, you know, on the news and we're witnessing these things again, I feel that we are constantly being traumatized mm. or I am constantly being traumatized by these images. And then I'm feeling even, you know, sensitive all over again, even more so about, you know, what it is to be a black mother. And so, um, you know, I think- and wanting to protect I, your boys, you know, from, from that, from that angst, that anger, that frustration, that uncertainty. Um, let's, let's segue Heather into the video. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, the imagery is, you know, definitely, you know, it's very powerful. And so we want, you know, our audience to be able to share it, uh, to be able to see visually. Right. So this video here is um, what happened after the storm. If I can explain it a little better. We, yes. Mm -hmm. The night, the the day that we that I finished videotaping the um, safe passage video, there was a heavy, heavy, heavy rainstorm, and so the next day when I came in, I you know some of the witnesses were still in there and they were perfectly fine, mm -hmm. perfectly fine, in good condition, but you know I moved them out of the the installation and then I. Um, videotape myself just sitting in there, exhaling. And that's why I call this um, exhale is another name for it because that's pretty much what I'm doing. Just, it's like a meditative state within the safe passage installation um, that I built. It's just like, you know, just a, a much needed respite i would say after well, well water is very cleansing um you know no matter what your your spiritual background is but water can be very cleansing um in the sense of just kind of washing away and refreshing and replenishing you know um what whatever was before i'll put it that way Absolutely. And um, that's why I have some blue fabric in there to represent water as well. So it, 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 it connects exactly to what you're saying. So Heather, in our, our final minutes here with this conversation, what's next for you on your journey as an artist? What is next? Let's see. I wrote some things down because I didn't want to forget. Um, so <laughs> So right now I, I have a few things happening. I am in residence at, um, on Governor's Island with mm -hmm. an organization called Art Crawl Harlem. You can Ulysses find him. Ulysses is amazing. Ulysses, oh my gosh, I love him. <laughs> you could find more um, information on myself and the other residents at artcrawlharlem.org. Right after that, I, oh, and I will be showing my, um, the third iteration of the Safe Passage video on Governor's Island, July 30th. Um, it's, it is an ongoing 
body of work. So I started with my son at 11. We did him at 12. And then we're we're doing another iteration um, of the film now that he's 13. Um, and after that, I have the uh, fellowship at Gallery of Pharaoh, which is in Newark for six mm -hmm. months. Um, this coming weekend, celebrating Juneteenth, I'll be at the museum, the Montclair Museum with some other amazing, amazing artists um, for a fundraiser for um, this organization called Empower the Village. Mm -hmm. Okay, and um, I have the solo exhibit here at, at Bridge Art Gallery. And the date is, what's the date? July? 20th. July 16th. July 16th. Awesome. That's that's even mm -hmm. longer then. So um, I invite all of you to come and um, see this show, right, Cheryl? Absolutely. So do you envision creating um, more witnesses? Um, do you, or are you transitioning into, um, you know, another collection or, you know, Throughout your organic process, are the ancestors still speaking to you about, you know, creating, you know, even more, more witnesses? I think I'll always be creating those. I don't know. That's how I feel right now. Mm -hmm. um, I do. I am working on a body of work called Damage and Repair, which I think is, I think it's all related to like all of the work that I'm doing right now. This mm -hmm. um, body of work here at Bridge Art Art Gallery, I would call it a, a, a precursor to the Damage and Repair series. And um, as you could imagine, Damage and Repair, I'm thinking about the, the dualities of trauma mm -hmm. versus healing, um, obstacles versus triumph, triumph all of those things. So that's what I'm working on right now. Even at um, Art Crawl Harlem, I'm creating a full body, a brand new body of work. For the future, I, um, I really am very much interested in creating installation work. I'm very interested in using different types of, of mater materials that are speaking to me right now. And, you know, working in a, a larger, larger than I've ever worked before. So that's, that's what I'm thinking about for my, um, my, my future work at uh, residency. Well, so one thing I would, I would mention to you, Heather, or suggest to you is that um, the current iteration of the witness wall definitely has potential to be a larger you know, installation with, you know, larger, you know, sculptures or keeping them, you know, at the same size, but just, you know, much more expansive. Yes. And, um, you know, we'll definitely share images that we've, you know, taken in the gallery um, with you so you can use it as a part of, you know, future proposals. But, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many conversations that can be had uh, around, the whole concept of a witness wall and, you know, what are they witnessing? What stories do we want to hear? What stories do we need to tell now? Um, yeah. And it can go in so many different directions, but, you know, as we kind of close out this conversation, definitely want to recommend that everyone go over to Governor's Island. It's you know, the weather's going to be nice, I think, for the next couple of weekends. So um, go take the ferry over to Governor's Island. Check out what Ulysses has mm -hmm. going on at um, uh, at his uh, location because Heather is there. Theta Sandiford is there. Yeah. Um, and it's just such an amazing experience, not only in the space that Ulysses has created, but also, you know, other all of the other art um, installations that are available um, um, at uh, on Governor's Island, and definitely go to a Pharaoh, which is iconic in Newark. Um, there's 
you know, this is just the time and the season for so much, you know, creativity. So if you're sitting home and saying there's nothing to do, then you're not looking hard <laughs> enough. Because art is everywhere. Yeah. And we're so thankful, Heather, that you've taken the time out of your schedule to participate in this conversation. Um, thank you for all of the listeners, commenters, observers who have taken in uh, all of this uh, knowledge and creativity that's been shared by by Heather, and we're so you know, appreciative of you, of you, Heather, for sharing your your art babies with the Bridge Art Gallery family. And I'm speaking on behalf of myself and Christopher. And um, it's always great when we can come together and and talk all things art. Absolutely. <laughs> so thank you, everyone, and we'll see you next time and hopefully at the Bridge Art Gallery to uh, enjoy Heather's exhibition in person. We're open uh, by appointment only Monday through Friday and on Saturday and Sunday we're open from 12 until 6 p.m. So enjoy, stay safe, and we'll see you soon.